Alright, hello everybody. Welcome back to Everyday Hoops. I hope you guys are having a good day. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the games that happened yesterday on February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day. Well, late Valentine's Day. Uh, we're going to talk about the NBA All-Star Saturday night participants have been revealed. Some more rumors and just go around the league. Talk about things around the league that are happening. Alright? So, yeah, let's get right into it. First, we're starting with the games from yesterday. Um, we're starting with the Magic taking on the Toronto Raptors. Um, this was a very solid game. You know, the Raptors got off to a really good start in this game, up 35-27 to 27, um, after an end of the first. Uh, the Magic are not a good team on the second night of back-to-backs. They're not that good, so the Raptors kind of took advantage of that in the first quarter. It was a good first, but then the second quarter, the Magic come out to play. The Magic come out to play in the second quarter. Uh, Jalen Suggs, who had a really good game, and he's been playing actually pretty solid recently. He had he had a good second quarter. Franz Wagner was doing his thing. Wendell Carter and the Magic score 43 points in the second quarter and then go into halftime with a five point lead. Um, in the third quarter is very close with the Raptors finding their way back. Pascal Jakob Portal, um, Fred Van Vliet was passing the ball all around. I felt like and. We're going to the fourth quarter. The Raptors have a five-point lead. The Magic do make it a really good game. But then, you know, Jakob Pertl, Pascal Siakam, close this game out. And the Raptors win 123-113. to And yeah, for Toronto, they shot 60% from the field. Which, if you shoot 60% from the field, you're probably going to win games. Um, shot 60% from the field. Um, had five more assists. I rebounded Orlando 40-29. to had 11 blocks and 9 steals as well. Um, and Jakob Pertl. Jakob Pertl's second game back in Toronto uh, was amazing. 30 points, 9 rebounds, had 6 blocks. Shooting 15 for 17 from the field. Um, he was ridiculous. He was ridiculous in this game. So he, has the, he had the highest field goal percentage by a player who scored 30 points with no free throw attempts in NBA history. I think they say he's the third player to score 30 points on this high field goal percentage without a free throw. Since David Robinson and Clay Thompson did it, um, he was all over the place. You know, offense. You know, he gets easy buckets, rebound on dunks and layups, easy passes from other guys. And on defense, he was just he was a force on that defensive end. And yeah, so he's really good. Uh, I don't know how Toronto just gave up really like what a first and two seconds and Ken Birch for him. Yeah, he's he's way more valuable than that. And they sh- he showed it last night. Pascal Siakam had another good game, 26-4-6. and six. Scotty Barnes at 17-6-6. Six and six. Red Van Vliet at 10 points and 15 assists. He only shot 3 for 12, but he was moving the ball around. Uh, Precious Tachua had 11-13 and because Gary Trent, OG, and Anomi both didn't play again in this game. And Chris Boucher had 13 off the bench. But yeah, for Orlando, uh, they're not a good team. They're still young. They're not a good team on second night of back-to-backs. They're 1-10 in 10 on the second day of back-to-backs. Uh, Wendell Carter had 26, 6, and 5, and Jalen Suggs had 24 off the bench. Uh, Markel had 19, 6, and 5. He had a nice dunk in this game. But yeah, Paolo had 13. He shot 5 for 13. Franz Wagner had 9. Uh, besides Suggs, the bench really didn't do anything. Yeah, it was just a tough. The Magic are still young, and they're still trying to figure it out. All these guys are still trying to figure it out. So it, it's, it's understandable that they're not a good team on the second night of back to backs, you know? They're still young. They're really good. They're, I think they started the year like what five and twenty or something like that. Since then, they're nineteen and fifteen, going into the All Star break. So, yeah, they've had they've had a really good season. I really love watching them. Uh, next we had the TNT game, the best day, game of the night, the Celtics and the Bucks. We thought this was going to be a very disappointing game because for the Celtics, no Jason Tatum because of illness, no Jalen Brown, no Marcus Smart, no Al Horford, no Robert Williams. Their whole starting lineup didn't play in this game for Boston. They ran a starting lineup of Derek White, Sam Hauser, Grant Williams, Blake Griffin, Mike Muscala was their starting lineup. Um, actually, Robert Williams didn't play. He came off the bench. My bad. Um, but, yeah, this was this was supposed to be probably a blowout for Milwaukee. Milwaukee was just going to sneak by. But then, you know, the Celtics go off to a really good start in the first quarter. They lead the first 35-27 at the end of it. Uh, their three-point shot was really hidden. Guys like Sam Hauser, Derek White, Blake Griffin, Muscala, all in three-pointers. 
But then the Bucks come alive in the second quarter. The Bucks score 37 points in the second quarter. And they're going to go to run. Um, at the end of the first half, they're going to halftime with a one-point lead. Uh, the third quarter was very back and forth. I felt like in this game, like Giannis was doing everything in his power in the third to kind of jolt the Bucks, you know, to take over this game. But every time they do that, then someone on the Boston would hit a three or hit a big shot. Um, the Celtics even went up, went up 13 or 14 at one point after Michael Barr hit two free throws in the third quarter. And then the Bucks, of course, make their comeback. They're going up the fourth quarter with Celtics having a five-point lead. And the fourth quarter is just very... It looks like the Bucks are going to take this. You know, the Bucks. Joe Hart hits a three-pointer to go up six with 3.51 left. But then, after that moment, the Celtics end the fourth quarter on a 93 run, including Sam Hauser hitting a tough contested three-pointer to tie the game at 116. And this Celtics team forces the Bucks to go into overtime. And overtime, it looks like the Celtics might win. Derek White um, hits the first few shots in overtime. It looks like Boston might take this game. But then Drew Holiday, man. Drew Holiday showed why he was an all-star last night, hitting so many big shots. He had a big three-pointer with 25 seconds left. He had a two-point lead, and then Grayson Allen with a steal on the other end. Um, and then Giannis hits free throws to, cl to cl close out the game. And the Bucks win 131-125 in overtime, keeping their 11-game winning streak alive. And Drew Holiday was a star last night. Drew Holiday showed why he was an all-star last night. Tied his career high with 40 points, with 5 rebounds, 7 assists, 3 steals, shooting 13 for 21, and a career high 8 three-pointers he made. He was a, a sensational on the offensive end. I mean, hitting so many big shots. Um, he had a nice, like, half-court, we're not half-court three-pointer at the end of a quarter. He was just, he was on fire. He was on fire on offense and really helped carry this Bucks team to a win. Uh, Giannis also had 36, 13 and 9 with two blocks. He was amazing. Chris Middleton had 16 points and 11 rebounds off the bench. Grayson Allen was pretty solid in this game too, chipping in with 13 points. But yeah, this Bucks team was just, you know, they really struggled. A lot of people look at it as a struggle um, because they, they had to deal with the Celtics without any of their star players. And the Celtics almost won this game. But that's honestly more of a true testament to the Celtics. And how great this team is built. And how great they are. You know. Like. To go in without any of your starters. Basically. Except for one that came off the bench. Uh, any of your starters. Against the bet. Arguably one of the best teams in the league. A top five team in the league. And to force them to overtime. And, and have a actually an actual chance of winning. That, that's, that's huge. For Boston. You know, uh, Derek White had 27 and 12 assists, continuing his amazing play. He just won Player of the Week for last week's performances and followed up with 27 and 12 assists. He's been amazing for the Celtics. Uh, Malcolm Brogdon had 26 off the bench. He's been good. Uh, Mike Muscala had 18 and 8. Sam Hauser and Billy Griffin both are playing really well. Uh, Grant Williams had a double double. And yeah, I mean, the Bucks just showed their championship experience. Really, that's what it was. Showed their championship and playoff experience. And Drew Holiday and Giannis closed this game out for Milwaukee, who is now on an 11-game win streak and only now one game, I think not even half a game, behind Boston for the number one seed in the Eastern Conference, man. They, they really put it on the last month, going into All-Star break on a hot streak. You know, you love to see that. Now, the next game we had was the Kings and the Suns. Uh, the Suns still without Kevin Durant, but TJ Warren um, played his first game. Kevin Durant was on the bench in this game. He showed up in Phoenix. Um, this was a very good game as well. Um, the Suns really just kind of were chipping away little by little, taking the lead. Like The Kings were up by two at the end of the first, but then the Suns had a good second quarter. 35-29 they won it. They go into halftime. With a four point lead. Third quarter was tied. But in the fourth quarter. The Suns kind of just pulled away with it. You know like Devin Booker. And DeAndre Ayton really were. DeAndre Ayton was really good. In the fourth quarter of this game. And the Suns win 120 to 109. A uh, fun fact. The Suns have not lost a game in their division. This season. I think they're 9-0. Which is really good. But yeah. Um, Devin Booker 32 points. 13 for 20 from the field. Didn't even attempt a three pointer. 
Devin Booker was really just getting real buckets out there. DeAndre Hayton had 29 and 11, four steals, two blocks on 13 for 17 shooting. He's been doing really good the past two weeks. He's been he's been very playing really 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 well, and the Suns needed it. Uh, Josh Okoge, who has been actually a pretty solid player for the Suns, um, this season had 19 points. He started in this game. Chris Paul has 17 points, 19 assists, looking like vintage Chris Paul out there. Um, didn't really get a lot of help from the depth of the team, but star players and Josh Okoge won this game for Phoenix. And for Sacramento, Darren Fox has been playing absolutely amazing this year. Uh, he had 35, 4 and 4 last night. He hit four three pointers. He's been amazing. Love that he's in the All Star game. Demonis Sabonis had 24, 15 and 7. Uh, Kevin Herter had 18 points. But yeah, it was really the Suns just out playing Sacramento. Like they shot 57 percent from the field. Uh, four 17 turnovers. Had 10 more assists. Um, and that's how they won this game. It was really the big three of Paul, Aiden, and Booker with Jim Josh Kogi sp- sprinkled in. And the Suns are hitting their stride right now. Suns were out of the plane for a little while on a huge um, downfall. But the Suns have come right, right back. They're fourth right now in the West. And with that win, they're only one game behind Sacramento for number three. And they got Kevin Durant waiting in the wings. Like, this Suns team is coming, man. They're, they've just they just gotten a lot more dangerous. <laughs> gotten a lot more dangerous um, in the West. Uh, next game was the next TNT T game, the Warriors and the Clippers. The Warriors, again, of course, no Steph Curry, but Andrew Wiggins, who just had 29 the other day, didn't play in this game due to personal reasons. Um, this is a very back-and-forth back and forth streaks in this game. Like the Clippers got off to a really good start in the first quarter, um, up by double figures at one point. They led the effort in the first 31-23. to But then the second quarter was the opposite, the Warriors. Uh, Clay and Draymond. Um, even Ty Jerome and Kuminga for a little bit um, help guide the Warriors and then go into halftime um, with a four point lead scoring 42 points in the third quarter, four, second quarter but the third quarter it was the Kawhi Leonard show it was the Kawhi Leonard show um, he was basically doing anything he wanted out there in the third quarter he finished the third quarter with 13 points and the Clippers scored 44 in the third quarter, you put on an avalanche on the Warriors, led by Kawhi Leonard, but also getting some Paul George, some Terrence Mann, some Marcus Morris in the mix of it. Uh, the Clippers also had their this their first game with their new acquisition from the deadline. So Bowens, Highland, Eric Gordon, and Mason Plumlee all played in this game. And that third quarter is really di- the difference. Broke the game open, and the Clippers win 134-124. to 124. Kawhi Leonard, 33-7, and seven, shooting 12 for 17, hitting seven threes. Uh, Norman Powell had 24 points off the bench. He's been playing terrific. Uh, Paul George had 20 and 8 assists. Terrence Mann had 16. And the, I was thinking about this yesterday, watching this game, and even after the game, about the L.A. Clippers and how I feel like at the start of the year, everyone was like, if the, I mean, the last few years it's been always, if the Clippers are healthy, if the Clippers are healthy, if the Clippers are healthy, they're going to be in contention and all this stuff. You know, and this year it was the same. You know, if the Clippers are healthy, they're a dark horse to come out. Um, the Western Conference and all this stuff. But I feel like ever since the first like two months of the year, everyone's kind of forgotten about the Clippers. I feel like everyone's kind of put the Clippers to the side because they're like, ah, oh, they're going to be hurt or they're not going to be. Their chemistry is going to be off. They're not going to be there, and it's the Clippers. They have bad luck, so we just don't. We just forget about the Clippers. You know. But I feel like the Clippers are just this giant sleeping in the Western Conference. Well, maybe not a giant, but I mean, honestly, kind of like, like, I really, really like this Clipper team. Like, you look at this team, they got Kawhi Leonard, who, you know when it comes playoff time, he's going to play. No more rests in the playoffs. He's playing in the playoffs. And you know how well he performs in the playoffs. And he's been playing great this season. I mean, he's had to come back. I feel like he came back a little bit earlier and came back looking like Kawhi a lot earlier than we expected it. We thought he was just going to chill out the regular year. You know, just kind of take it here, take it, uh, go through the motions, and the playoff come, he hits. But because the Clippers are kind of struggling to start this year in the middle of the season, Kawhi had to come back and kind of tap into Kawhi mode a little bit earlier than what we thought he was going to do. 
but he's been he's been really amazing for this team. You know, Paul George has been very solid. He's an All Star this year. Um, he's had some moments to start the year. As years gone on, he's kind of been kind of just chilling. But he's still, I mean, an All Star level player. We all know that. So you got those two guys, and if they're healthy, which is a big if, but if they're healthy when it comes playoff time, they're gonna perform. Uh, and then you got Norman Powell, who's been playing excellent the last few months. He's in six man of the year conversation. He's pretty high up, six man of the year conversation. On um, Stat Muse, shout out to Stat Muse on Twitter. Um, but Norman Powell, he's averaging 17 points. He leads the NBA in points per game off the bench. Um, he's third in total points off the bench. He's shooting 41.7 percent from three. And the Clippers are the highest scoring bench team in the league. And Owen Powell's been a huge factor for that. He's come in and been just a microwave and a spark plug for them when they need offense. Because their starting lineup, is a little, I feel like it's a lot more defense-based. Like, they don't have a really regular point guard in the starting lineup. Terrence Mann is their point guard now. Then you got PG, Kawhi, Marcus Morris, and Zubak. They have a big starting lineup. But now look at their bench lineup. Their bench lineup provides a lot of scoring. Like, their bench lineup, they got Powell. But then they also just picked up Eric Gordon and Bones Island, two scorers. Mason Plumlee, you know, you still got Batum and Covington to kind of be in there just for defense purposes as well. But, yeah, Norman Powell's been great. Then you got guys like Zubak, who's really good. Terrence Mann has had moments. Marcus Morris is very, gets hot and gets cold. Um, but when he gets hot, he's another option. And then again, the bench, you got Bones Highland and Eric Gordon now, who are two professional scores while well, Eric Gordon is more of a professional scorer now. Bowens Highland more of a point guard but can score at times as well. Mason Plumlee was a very good get for them as well. They needed they wanted another backup center for Zubox so they didn't have to play Zubox heavy minutes. But now they got Mason Plumlee who can play heavy minutes and can do a lot of different things. He can you know he's can pick and roll, he can catch lobs, he can pass the ball pretty well. Um solid solid defender. He's very good. Then you got the vets like Nick Batum. It's a Swiss Army knife that can come in and fill any spot you need. You know, Robert Covington is still on this team. He can come in and play defense. You've got Amir Coffey who can stretch the floor and play solid defense when they put him out there. Like, this Clipper team is real. Like, you look at their team on paper, and they look amazing. You know, and even when they play, sometimes they're good. It's just getting them to play consistently. You know, because of all the injury history with Kawhi and PG and them kind of taking it safe and stuff. But this team at full strength coming into the playoffs, this is a team you do not want to mess with. Like, this is a team they don't want to mess with. Like, honestly, this is the team. I won't be surprised if they play. Right now, they put the Suns in the first round. That would be that would be an amazing matchup. The Suns and the Clippers. But the Clippers have a really good chance. And honestly, if the Clippers beat the Suns in the first round, I don't, to be honest, I don't really see anybody beating them after that. Like, the Nuggets they'll have a good chance with. Um, maybe Denver, I guess. Because Denver's just a really good all-around team as well. But, like, I don't know. I just, there's something about this Clipper team that I feel like people aren't really talking about them. People aren't really putting them up there anymore. Because they've kind of they've disappointed us ever since they put together this Kawhi and Paul George team. They haven't really played a lot together, and they've been very disappointing. But I mean, this team, man, they can get they can just stay healthy, and I don't even mind them sitting Kawhi and PG some nights because when it comes to the playoffs, you know they're both gonna play. They're both gonna be there. Kawhi at least is gonna be at his highest level. Paul George, hopefully, he can. He can be. And you got Tyron Lue, one of the better coaches in the league. Their depth has just gotten significantly better after the trade deadline. Um, they have so many pieces on this team they can throw in different spots. They have so many players where if one isn't playing good, they can just substitute in another guy for a series and let him go. Um, like this team, I just I just feel like this team isn't getting the, the talk around the league that they should be. And I think when it comes to playoff time, this team is going to be a force to reckon with. And they can definitely ups- I feel like they can definitely upset a Nuggets or a Grizzlies or a Suns maybe team. And maybe make a maybe make a conference finals or NBA finals run, potentially. But yeah, that's my 
rant about the Clippers, I guess. On behalf of the Warriors, they're back to 500. Uh, they're down to the ninth seed. Uh, they're going into an all-star break. It's going to be very tough, you know, without Steph Curry and then also without Andrew Wiggins. Um, it's going to be very tough, but they just got to hold on and stay around 500. I feel like if they could just stay around 500 until Steph comes back, then I think they would be good. You know, but it's about staying around 500. And with the West, that race being so tight, they can't really afford to go on a losing streak because they're going to fall down to out of the plane very, very quickly. You know? So, yeah, hopefully Steph comes back soon and they can kind of right the ship. Um, and the last game of the night was the Wizards and the Trailblazers. Uh, this game was blown open in the second half. Like, the first half was very tight. You know, the Wizards go in the first half up by seven. But then the third quarter happens. And the Wizards outscore Portland 38-22 to in the third quarter. Kyle Kuzma came back after missing a few games with an ankle injury. He came back and put on a great performance. Damian Lillard was trying his best out there, obviously. But the Wizards just were putting it on him. You know, Chris Osborne's thing is Bradley Beal, Kyle Kuzma, that big three. They got really put it on him and blew this game open. They went up by 21. Or actually, um, 23 at the end of the third and didn't look back. The Wizards win 126 to 101. Kyle Kuzma is 33 and 9, hitting six threes in his first game back. Chris Asperzingas continues his excellent season with 28, 12, and 5. And Bradley Beal had 19. Um, and it was really those three. Like, everyone else was kind of just out there. It was really the big three of Washington putting this game to rest. Washington shot 57% from the field. They had 17 threes. Um, had eight more assists. I rebounded to Port- Portland. And their big three was going off. Uh, for Portland, Dame had 39, 10, and 6, doing Dame things. Uh, Cam Reddish had 18 points and four threes. Love seeing him out there doing what he's doing. Anthony Simons had 17 before leaving this game with an ankle injury. Hopefully he's okay. Uh, Shaden Sharp had 14 off the bench. He had a nasty dunk. Dude is literally a video game when he jumps. Like, I was telling this to my dad. Like, this dude is literally like a video game. Like, when he jumps in the air, it's like a, it's a video game. Like, I feel like he, he doesn't know what gravity is when he when he jumps. Like, he can literally go anywhere he wants. He can go as high as he wants to when he jumps, and you just can't really do anything about it, which is why I'm so mad that he dropped out of the dunk contest because he was going to be the absolute winner. Like, he was going to be a 100% unanimous winner. I feel like everyone was going to put all their money on him. I would put all my money on him to win it. Um, but, unfortunately, he dropped out of the dunk contest saying he wants to focus on the second half of the year, which I don't know why because they suck. <laughs> so, I, I don't know. But, yeah, sucks we can't see that. But I mean, we have to. He has to be in the dunk contest at some point in his career. Maybe next year or the year after. He's got to be in the dunk contest. If not, then that's, then, I don't know. Then we get the shame to the NBA. But, yeah, Washington, it's a solid win, I guess. And they're still in the plane. They're 10th right now. And Portland is 11th. Tied with the Thunder for 11th. Um. So, yeah, speaking of the dunk contest and all that, the All-Star Saturday night participants have been announced for the Skills Challenge, three-point contest, and the dunk contest. Um, we'll get that to you right now. So first, we're starting off with the Skills Challenge. Uh, if you don't know, they have the new format they tried last year where it's three teams of three players, and they're going to battle battle out in the Skills. And, yeah, last year was Team Cleveland. That won because the, team, the All-Star weekend was in Cleveland last year. So it was Team Cleveland won. This year is in Utah. Um, so here are the three teams for the Skills Challenge. The first team is Team Antetokounmpo running it back after last year. So we got Giannis, the Nassis who also plays in the Bucks, and Alex Antetokounmpo, the youngest brother that plays in the G League with the Wisconsin Herd. Um, those three are a team. Then we have Team Jazz, which of course is in Utah. So we got the Jazz have a team. It is Con Sexton, Jordan Clarkson, and Walker Kessler, the rookie. Um, very interesting to see Walker Kessler and not Larry Marketing, but I guess Larry Marketing is in the three point contest and he's in the All Star game, so maybe they just wanted someone else from Utah to be in there. And then we have the team rookie, the rookie team with Paolo Boncaro, Jane Ivey, and Jabari Smith Jr. I'm surprised no Benedict Matherin in the skills challenge. I'm surprised they picked Jabari Smith, but maybe because he was number three overall, they wanted to pick him. 
Uh, but they picked Jane Ivy. Well, then again, because Chet Holmgren can't play. Um, but then again, they also have Keegan Murray. I don't know how they picked Team Rookie. Should have picked probably put Benedict Matherin in there. But I guess they wanted maybe another big because they already have a guard, a big. I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, those are the Skillless Challenge participants. Um, does anyone really care about the Skillless Challenge? No, but it's just another thing that's in there. Um, my prediction, I'm going with Team Rookie. I'm going with Team Rookie running the Skillless Challenge. Um, yeah, hopefully we get a good moment like last year. Did remember that last year moment with Scotty Barnes and Tyrese Maxey? I forgot what that was. I don't even know if that was a Skillless Challenge. That was just something extra I think they put in. But those two, like, literally couldn't hit a layup in the Skillless Challenge. That was one of the funniest moments of last year. But, yeah, I'm going with Team Rookie, I guess. Um, anyway, we got the three-point contest. The eight participants have been announced. We have Tyrese Halliburton, Tyler Hero, Buddy Heald, Kevin Herter, Damian Lillard, Larry Marketin, Anthony Simons, and Jason Tatum. Um, surprising Tyrese Halliburton is on here and Tyler Hero. Like, those two aren't really, like, three-point marksmen or three-point shooters like everyone else on here is. But, um, I mean, I guess so, so yeah. Um... My early prediction, I got Kevin Herter. I got Kevin Herter winning the three-point contest. I feel like he's kind of built for the three-point contest. I would have picked Buddy Heald, um, but then I saw Kevin Herter. I was like, you know what, Kevin Herter. Or Anthony, my dark horse is Anthony Simons winning it. Because I feel like Anthony Simons could get hot and hit threes quickly. It would be cool to see him because Anthony Simons won a dunk contest a few years ago. Cool to see him win the three-point in the dunk contest in his career. Um, But yeah, Kevin Herter. I got him one in the three-point contest. And then finally, we have the dunk contest. Um, the four participants are Kenya Martin Jr. from the Houston Rockets, Trey Murphy, the third, Jericho Sims in the New York Knicks. And we have our G- uh, first G-leaguer, Mac McClung, who plays for the Delaware Blue Coats, the Philadelphia 76ers G-league affiliate, is in the dunk contest. But Mac McClung also, um, I think yesterday or the day before, um, signed a two-way contract with Philly, so now he's officially on the roster. Um, he still goes back and forth in the G League on a two-way contract. You play in the G League, but you also get called up to the NBA and play and be on the NBA roster as well. Um, so yeah, he got called up on a two-way contract. So shout out to him. Um, my and I got him winning the dunk contest. I got Mac McClung winning the dunk contest. Uh, I feel like Trey Murphy is a very weird ad because he's not. He can dunk and he's had some good dunks, but I don't think of him as a dunker. Like he's a sniper. He's just like he should have been in the three-point. Con- if he was in a three-point contest, that makes a lot of sense. But him being the dunk contest is very interesting, but maybe he can pull something out of his bag. Uh, Jericho Sims. Centers usually don't do super well in a dunk contest. Um, if you're not, like, super, like, Dwight Howard athletic. And Jericho Sims isn't Dwight Howard athletic, even though he can catch lobs and stuff. But I don't know about him in a dunk contest, I guess. KMR and Jr. is a good get, though. KMR and Jr. literally tries to dunk everything. <laughs> he tries to dunk everything. And he's had some really nice dunks. So um, I think it's probably going to be, be between Kenya Martin Jr. and Mac McClung, who is super athletic as well. And I got Mac McClung winning, winning the dunk contest, putting on for the G League. Um, and yeah, those are the All-Star Weekend participants. Very excited. This weekend is All-Star Weekend. So we got the Celebrity Game um, and then the Rising Stars game. Or the Rising Stars games, because the Rising Stars is like a little tournament. Now, um, on Friday, Saturday, we got all the festivities, the skills, the three-point, the dunk contest, and then Sunday, we got the all-star game. Um, and they have the players picking, um, the captains, LeBron and Giannis, picking their all-star game and picking who they're going to play. Is LeBron playing in the all-star game? Probably, because they said he's probably playing tonight against New Orleans, so I guess he's probably going to play in the all-star game. Um, when's that? Has LeBron ever missed an All Star game? Thinking about, it, I don't know. I don't think LeBron's ever missed an All Star game, like due to injury. I don't think so. Maybe, maybe that year where he was the, the first year with the Lakers, he might have missed the All Star game. I don't fully remember off the top of my head though. Um, but yeah, very rare for LeBron to miss an All Star game because of injury. Very rare for him to be injured in general. Um, except for the last few years as a Laker. But, yeah, so those are the All-Star Weekend participants. Now we're just going around some rumors in the NBA. Is per Jake Fisher. 
um, um, known reporter saying that there were rumblings around the league that Phoenix was hoping to somehow land both Kyrie and KD at the trade deadline. Uh, Kyrie Irving, before he got traded to Dallas, Phoenix was on the list of one of the teams that was targeting him. Um, and then, of course, you know about the Cavalier and Phoenix situation before he even got there. It even came out after that KD said he wanted to go to Phoenix and Sean Marks kind of was like, okay, sure, you can go to Phoenix. Um, but yeah, they're only hoping to land KD and Kyrie. What would that look like? The Suns, Chris Paul had to be in the trade. So it's probably going to be what, with the KD package. So Mikael, Cam Johnson, Cam, um, Jake Ryder, the picks. And then probably adding in Chris Paul. Maybe, or maybe they had, had to have another pick or two. Because you're getting KD and Kyrie. You know, and Kyrie got back a first and two seconds and two solid players. So I guess that'd be Chris Paul. Maybe they have to give up, like, another bench player and then another pick. Or maybe, like, two second-round picks. Throw it in there as well. Because the Suns gave up for a protected first in a swap. But yeah, I imagine that would be probably the biggest trade in NBA history, right? KD and Kyrie both getting traded to Phoenix. Like, that would that would have been insane. That would have been insane. Twitter, I got an NBA media, but it just, it would have just blew up. Like, it would have exploded. Like, that would have been absolutely insane if that would have happened. Um, the next one is from Mark Stein. He's talking about Grant Williams. Grant Williams is going to be a restricted free agent in the offseason. Um, after not, him and the Celtics couldn't really come to an agreement on a contract um, before the year. But they're going to have probably more, negotiate, more negotiate, negotiations after the season. Wow, that word killed me. Um... He was talking about Grant Williams saying, Grant Williams is said to be seeking a contract in the Keldon Johnson in San Antonio, $20 million annually range. Um, yeah, there was a lot of stuff even before the trade deadline that Grant Williams might be the name on some team's radar, including the Miami Heat, because he's looking for some money. He's, raging. he's looking for money. He's looking for about an $18 to $20 million a year contract. Um, he's turned into a very valuable role player. Um, and one of the better role players in the league um, in Boston. And now he's looking to get his money, um, which I can't can't really blame him for. He wants his money. Um, is he going to get 18 to 20 mil from Boston? He might. He might. I don't know. Boston might look at him and be like, you know what, Grant? You've been such a, um amazing f- player for us. You've helped us so much, especially if they win a championship this year. If they win a championship this year, I think they got to give him the money right like he's probably gonna be a good part in winning the championship for him so I feel like if they win he, they have to give him the money if they don't I can still see him giving him the money but then again there's some part of me that I, I could kind of see Grant Williams kind of leaving for some see him in another jersey for some reason um I like him in Boston so I hope Boston doesn't give him up but I mean it's a business at the end of the day so if Boston doesn't see Grant Williams as an 18 to 20 mil team, but a 20, 18 to 20 mil player, but maybe a team like Miami or like Milwaukee, or maybe Milwaukee which doesn't have that money like that, but maybe a team like Miami um, sees him and is like, you know what, we'll pay him 18 to 20 mil to be our power forward. And maybe a deal gets done, I don't know. But yeah, I, I can't really follow Grant Williams for one 18 to 20 mil because he knows he's a valuable role player. He's very valuable to the Boston Celtics. Um, he's a guy that can defend very well on the perimeter, which a lot of teams love. Um, he's turned into a very good three point. He's turned into a very respectful, very good three point shooter as well, and just does a lot of the little things like the rebounding, the hustle play, stuff like that. So teams, teams will teams love a Grant Williams, um, and I think Boston should pay him the money. Uh, and the last one is about Ben Simmons. Uh, Reports saying that the Brooklyn Nets are expected to shop Ben Simmons in the offseason and look for probably a trade for him after trading away KD and Kyrie. Kind of makes sense that the Nets are like, you know, okay, you know what? We're blowing this whole thing up. Ben can go. Everyone can go. And we're going to just go young. But yeah, and even it came after, after Jacques Vaughn, the head coach of the Nets, said um, some stuff about Ben Simmons. He said, quote, 
you got you put another big next to Ben. Then you got to figure out what the spacing is around him. Then if you put another playmaker next to him, then you got to figure out what Ben looks like without the basketball. End quote. He was talking about um, the challenges of playing Ben Simmons and how to play Ben because he has such a unique skill set and what's going on with him about you know him not wanting to put the ball on the floor, him not wanting to shoot the ball, um, him being very passive. I mean, it is very challenging to have him on the team because he is a point guard and plays like a point guard, but also the Nets don't have the capability of a stretch five. Um, like all their big men, Nick Claxton, Dayron Sharp, are are not shooters. They're all, you know, give me throw lobs to me, pick and roll throw lobs, or like dump it off to him on the um next to the rim. He's gonna dunk it. You know, he's always in the dunker spot type of bigs. And so it just really shrinks the floor, especially with the pace and space of today's NBA. It's like you really don't want that on your team. You don't want two players out there that can't even shoot a mid-range jumper, let alone a three-pointer. Um, so, yeah, you got that going on. And then, again, you want to play him as a big man. Um, But then, again, he's just going to be sitting in the dunker spot and maybe not even go for the dunk <laughs> or go for the layup. Like he kind of needs to have the ball in his hand a little bit to play make for everyone else because he's a very talented playmaker, um, which is probably his best trait. And he's a really good defender, so you want to put him at the five to kind of protect the rim and can you switch out to anybody. But then on offense is very tough because you kind of can't just have him sit in the Nick Claxton role, the Darren Sharp, where he's just sitting down low in the dunker spot all game because his talent, his skill set is him having the ball. And making plays for everybody else coming downhill, collapsing defense and kicking it out to the shooters. Um so yeah, it's very it's very tough for Ben Simmons. It's been a very rough past year and a half for him. And now he's probably gonna be moving on to his next team in the off season. Which I was thinking, what team really wants or needs a Ben Simmons? Like I can't really picture him. Like, if you look at the re- bad rebuilding teams, they don't want anything to do with Ben Simmons, even though they have the money to take on a Ben Simmons contract. Um, they don't really have a need for Ben Simmons, um, which is going to be another big factor. That's why Ben, it's going to be tough to trade Ben because his contract is insane. He's going to pay 34 and a half mil this year. Next year, his pay goes up to 37.8. And then in 2025, he'll be paid 40 million dollars 40 mil Come on, I'm 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 going to say that again 40 million dollars for Ben Simmons for Ben for Ben Simmons in 2025 and then in 2026 he'll be an unrestricted free agent but yeah that that yeah and it's crazy because you look at the con because he signed this back in Philly when he was still an All Star and he made All NBA third team and he was top two in defense player of the year and he was like that, like it was like it made sense. Like you you saw the projection he was gonna be probably a multiple time All Star even if he never developed the shot he was still gonna give you a good fifteen nine and eight or fifteen nine and seven fifteen nine and seven eighteen nine and seven something like that. But now, I mean, he can't, he doesn't want to score. <laughs> he doesn't even want to look at the rim to even think about scoring. Like, it's it's insane, the career trajectory of Ben Simmons going from, you know, starting his career being like, all right, he can score, he scores a lot in the paint, wanting to be a little more aggressive, can't really shoot the ball, but maybe that's something he'll go right into, to, all right, he doesn't really want to shoot threes, but he can still give you a good 16, 18, because I mean, he's going to, and he's 6'10", he's just going to get to the paint, score on dunks and fast break points because he's going to get a lot of steals and be out in transition a lot. And then it turned into, all right, this dude doesn't even want to score. He doesn't really look at the basket as much as we want him to, but he still gives us, I mean, he's like 12, 14, so I guess that's cool. To now, it's like you can't really play him a lot of minutes. Like He doesn't even start anymore now for Brooklyn. He comes off the bench now. For Brooklyn, because he doesn't want to shoot the ball, 
He doesn't want to even look at the rim to score. And it's just like, what? I don't know what he really can do about it. Like, we've never, we've never really seen it like this before. Like, what can you really, you can't really, like, force him to score. So you just kind of have to hope that he will just find his confidence again and hope that someone can give him a pep talk or maybe something can happen where he can kind of get his confidence back and look to want to score and go back to being that, you know, guy that can give you 17, 9, and 9 um, and get triple-doubles and average a good, like, 16, 8, and 7 a game. But, yeah, it's very tough. I don't know what team would want a Ben Simmons again. Um, Like, looking around at some of the teams, some situations, it's like, who really needs a Ben Simmons-level player on their team? Who would, who could realistically get a Ben Simmons-level player? The Heat, and the, I don't know about the Heat. They already got Jimmy and Bam. They don't need another non-shooter on their team. Um... The Hawks. The Hawks were a team that are interested in Ben Simmons. Maybe the Hawks, I guess. You do already have Clint Capella down there. Um, but you have Trey, DeJounte. You got shooters. Some shooters around him. Maybe a Ben Simmons for John Collins trade, I would guess. Two bad contracts getting traded for each other. Um, Toronto. He would fit the mold, but the Raptors don't have any shooting already. What the Nets get? Like The Raptors aren't giving up Scotty for Ben. Gary Trent and Fred Ramley are going to be free agents, so they might leave unless they do like a slow signing deal. But then again, if the Nets are going young, why would they want Gary or Fred Van Vliet? Maybe Gary, but why would they even want Fred Van Vliet? Yeah, it's not like Gary's going to get paid enough money to put him in a Ben Simmons package. And Pascal, I mean, then again, why would the Nets want Pascal even anyway as well? Because again, they're probably going into a rebuild mode. They don't want Pascal. So I can't see him in Toronto. Indiana, maybe, but then again, Tyrus Halliburton kind of runs their offense. So it's like, now you got to give some of that up to, to, to Ben Simmons. I mean, they have the spacing. They have a three-point shooting center. Well, sorry, the Nets don't, and the Pacers don't really have a power forward. But then again, who are you giving up? The Pacers don't have that many big contracts. Like, unless you have, unless you are giving up Miles Turner um, for Ben Simmons. And again, why the Nets want Miles Turner? Like, and then you look at the West. The Kings, no. They already have some bonus. They don't need Ben Simmons. Uh, the Mavericks. Luka has the ball all the time. And if you want... They, if the Nets would... If the Mavericks would want another all-star level player, they would want someone that can actually score and handle the ball. Ben Simmons doesn't score. Uh, Minnesota, no, Minnesota's got Rudy Gobert. Uh, the Jazz... Maybe, but then who would the Jazz give up to the to the Nets of value, a young value like Con Sexton? Um, well, they weren't not giving up a Lowry for Ben Simmons, no way. Um, yeah, this is I don't know who 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 needs Ben Portland, Portland, Portland. I'm not giving up Simons or Sharp for Ben. Um. I don't know if they have any, like, big contracts. Maybe if they do a sign-in trade with Jeremy Grant, but then again, the Nets, would they want Jeremy Grant? I don't, I don't, I really don't know. Like, I really don't know where Ben Simmons can go. Like, team that would want him. Um, there's, there, yeah, there's no one, there's no, I don't see a team right now that I can see that's like, okay, it makes sense for Ben Simmons to go there, or they have the pieces for a Nets trade to get a Ben Simmons or a team that would fit that would want a Ben Simmons. Like, I honestly feel like he's just kind of stuck right now. Maybe the offseason, you know, the offseason things, a lot of things happen, so maybe there's a team that does open up that maybe goes into a rebuild or goes into something that's like, you know, we'll take a chance on Ben Simmons, maybe give him a second, a second chance. Um, But after, besides that, we got to wait till the offseason because that's the only time he can't get traded. But... Right now, I don't really know where Ben Simmons can go, where he can, where team a team would want him and actually play him. You know. But yeah, hopefully Ben does find 
stopped in, and hopefully this isn't the rest. This isn't bad for the rest of his career. Hopefully he can maybe find himself again, maybe a new cha change of scenery on a new young team that kind of lets him do what he wants, or gives him freedom, you know, to kind of play through whatever. Can maybe give him a re a re a rejuvenation, and maybe he can go back to being Philly Ben Simmons. But as of right now, I mean. This is right. This is Ben Simmons right now, you know, a seven point per game score. That's 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 crazy. Um, but yeah, that's the end of today's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, yeah, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.